always took my job a little bit further. So I was able to be the middle person from um, the fashion world. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. All right, now let's get into the episode. So today in the guest chair, we have the one, the only Carlene Roy. Carlene is as extraordinary as the events she creates. The secret to her success is clear. She possesses an awe-inspiring ability to wed boundless imagination with meticulous attention to detail, producing bespoke special events and luxury experiences of unsurpassed excellence for luminaries, trendsetters, and today's brightest stars. Carlene specializes in producing magical moments, and her own story reads like a fairy tale, which you'll hear all about in the episode. So after graduating from Howard University, the Memphis native moved to New York in 2004, armed with nothing but ambition and a dream. She then landed a job in the publicity department at Island Def Jam Recordings and immediately gained recognition for her exceptional skills and dedication. She was recruited first by R&B artist Neil to oversee the day-to-day operations of his management company, and later by Sean Diddy Combs himself, who brought Carlene on as his senior executive assistant at Bad Boy Entertainment. Combs came to rely on Carlene extensively to coordinate the efforts of his multi-million dollar business entities, external partnerships, and talent relationships, and also manage the details of his complex social itinerary and whirlwind private life. The confidence, expertise, and international connections Carlene developed over the course of her career inspired her in 2011 to strike out on her own. The Vanity Group quickly became the firm of choice for a variety of corporate clients and A-list celebrities. And today we're going to talk about how she started that Vanity Group and how she grew it to what it is today. Carlene has been featured in Forbes, Vogue, InStyle, and other national publications. She and her stellar team at the Vanity Group specialize in clients who demand the very best. Carlene basically brings the magic that no one else can do. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Three, two, one. So welcome to the guest chair, Carlene. Oh my God, I'm happy to be here. I haven't done an interview like this in a while, so I'm excited to um, be a part. Thank you for asking me to, to do it. Oh, of course, of course. I've wanted you in the guest chair for a while, so I'm glad we <laughs> were able to make it happen. So now, Carlene, I have experienced firsthand your expertise at <laughs> producing magical moments, you know, during the My Taught You retreat. And I just remember as I was, was experiencing the retreat, you know, met you there for the first time and I was just blown away. Like I would literally just stare at you sometimes thinking about the attention to details and wondering how does someone even develop an eye and a mind for producing this? How do you even think about this stuff, right? So what's your earliest memory of wanting to produce events? I That's an interesting question. I never wanted to be an event producer, an event planner. It never was something that I sought out to be. It is something that innately I became uh, good at. Everybody knows the story of me being Puff's assistant. And one big part of my job was the events that he would do, whether it was his children's birthday party, or maybe he was doing a launch for a new fragrance, or maybe he was just having a really dope party in his backyard in the Hamptons. It was my job as the assistant to spearhead and put all of this together. A lot of times it was always with little to no time. So I just became really well at getting um, things done in a very short amount of time and still at a very pristine and sophistication, sophisticated level. And I think my um, ability to like think of every detail and make sure everything is perfect just came out of fear of me losing my job because I was work, <laughs> working, it's very honest, because I was working for the hardest working man in show business and working with a man who had such an elevated level of taste and had such a very keen aesthetic eye. So I knew if I was ever half stepping, I was going to be on the chopping block. You know, I had a very coveted job. So I think my fear of wanting to 
um, and not even fear, like my yearning to wanting to impress my boss and wanting to kill it every time is what got the spark to be like, oh, I actually am good at this. I actually am thriving um, with this. So I don't think the original spark was, I want to be an event planner. I think the original spark was, this is something that I'm good at. Oh, okay. And I think we can all relate to that wanting to that yearning to impress a boss and how that like that adrenaline definitely helps you be on point yes because people who are lazy they're not good (laughs) right so i did read your bio but not everyone truly knows the specifics or the details of how you went from howard to you know mr combs assistant to now the vanity group so let's take it back a little bit um as i mentioned you went to howard what did you study there and what was your original intention career-wise i know we all have big dreams when we're 18 we think we're going to be a million things before life kind of guides us to our path so what was your initial career dream yeah i originally went to howard pre-med i thought i wanted to be a physician more specifically a dermatologist i was always very fascinated with beauty and i'm like oh this is a doctor to make sure that your skin is popping that you're like put together like sign me up this type of doctor i want to be so i originally went to school to on the path of being a pre-med student at howard that lasted all of a semester and i was like (laughs) science i hate math and these were classes in college that you needed to excel in if you were on the path to becoming a doctor. So I quickly uh, went left with that decision. And for maybe three years, I actually went undecided. I didn't have a major. I really was going through life figuring out. And I took a sociology class as an elective. And I said, oh, I like this. I should maybe major in it. Like I really enjoyed the classes. I enjoyed learning. So it wasn't to my junior year in school that I picked a major, um, which was sociology, and I still didn't have a minor. And I was watching um, Sex in the City, and I saw Samantha, and I said, wow, who is this woman? She looked powerful, she was fly, and she worked for herself, and she did parties, and she worked with, you know, all these the powerful people in New York City, and I didn't know what she did. I remember asking a girlfriend, and like the study lounge at Howard, I was like, oh my God, have you heard of this show called Sex in the City? Do you know this character, Samantha? She said, yeah, she's a publicist. And I immediately went that day to like the side of my minor. Like I went to the School of Communications and said, like, I want to be a PR minor. So that actually led me to being in school an extra year. So I was a super senior. I was in school five years because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I'm thankful that I had parents that didn't pressure me to say like, do you need to decide what you're going to do or your life is o- over? So I always had parents that let me dream and explore. So I stayed an extra year because it took me a little bit longer than everybody else to figure out what I wanted to do. Oh. And then after college, yeah, I, and, I'm, and I'm a fan of that. Everybody, I don't think everybody needs to go to college. I don't think everybody's going to finish in four years. If anything else, I think uh, college teaches you how to be independent. Yes. I think it teaches you how to deal with the crisis on your own and the crisis could be you haven't got your financial aid check clear yet and you got to figure it out your crisis can be you got moved from one dorm to the next and you have to figure it out on on its own so it's those types of coming of age moments that um, college especially if you go away to college and you're away from your family it teaches you independence and that I think is the beauty of higher education um for for young people. I agree. Yeah. But I get what you're saying. I think that, and I think we need to do more framing of college in that way because there's this expectation that you're going to go there. You're going to immediately within a few months know what your major is going to be and figure your life out in four years. And that's not true. If anything, you have time to explore, test out a few things and realize what you don't want to do, but you're not going to figure it out in four years. Not at all. Um, NYU has this really amazing program. We get interns from there sometimes. I believe it's called the School of Individualized Study, and it's so dope. It basically is what we're speaking about. It gives the student ability to think and explore college, and you put together your major on your own. You can say, I want to major in textiles, but music and light and art, and they will create this 
program for you, which I think is um, such a light. And I wish more schools um, adopted this program. But um, to move on, I graduate. I barely graduate. I barely. I like beg my way to graduating. <laughs> five five years in. Pass. Okay. No, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't pass like the math class. I was like, yo, this is too difficult. Um, so I begged my way. I finally graduated. My dad was like, okay, you got another few months. And you're getting cut off Hillary Bank style. Um, but uh, I graduated from school and I used to always come to New York to intern and shadow people. And while I was in New York, one time I met a young lady. She worked at Def Jam and she worked at Def Jam in publicity. And I was like, oh, my God, this is my dream job. Like, how can I work there? How can I be down? But she was an, an assistant and she wasn't in a position of power. And this is an important part for young people because sometimes you don't know who the decision makers are. And she wasn't in the position of power and she was very transparent. Like, I don't do the hiring and firing, but I know that if you are my intern, if a job comes available, if you're in a building, you'll probably be one of the first people that they consider. So that was all I needed to get me from Washington, D.C., to New York City. I told my parents, I'm like, I'm getting a U-Haul truck. I'm putting all my belongings in this U-Haul truck. I'm going to New York City and I'm going to enter at a record label for free, not get paid. Wow. I made an arrangement to sleep on a girlfriend's couch for a few months until I like got my footing. Um, and that is what got me from DC to, to New York City. Just I love it. taking a chance on life and saying, if this is the industry I want to be in, if this is the industry that values like starting from the bottom and working your way up, then it's like, I got to like put on my big girl panties and do just and that. Do it. And, you know, I want to stop here for a second and, and really emphasize that because um, I'm going to be honest with you, Carlene, like I didn't have that in me. Right. So I, there was a time when I was an assistant and, um, I was just like, this is for the birds. <laughs> I was, and then, I, and then I, I thought about switching into other industries and I was like, I'm paid internship. And it took me a while to really understand when it's worth doing this. And I think it's a nuanced thing. So how, can you explain like, when is it, when is it okay to take an internship, even though you're a college grad with bills to pay? How do you know when you are leading yourself to a better opportunity or when, and you're not being exploited? Mm, that's a good one. I never was afraid to jump, first and foremost. I don't know if you have any kids, but if you ever see a little boy in a, usually little boys in playground and just kids in general, they'll climb to the toppest, toppest, most highest place and jump. They don't care. They don't care if they're going to break their neck. They don't, the mom is over on the side like, oh my God, little Jimmy, don't do it. But you know, <laughs> kids are, they're not afraid to jump. They don't, they're fearless. And I've been like that a long time in my life. So I was not, I wasn't afraid to be in unorthodox situations. Um, whereas most people would be like, I'm not moving to the most expensive city and without a job, right. without a place of my own and without a roommate where I was like, oh yeah, I'm with it. Like I just was unafraid. But I, and as far as not being taken advantage of, I think you will you will very quickly learn if you are in these unorthodox situations, if the people you are working with are working for are people who want to see you win, people who are trying to support you or champion you, or even people who are trying to, to challenge you, you know, and New York is a city where everybody is hustling and scamming and, and trying to get free work. So I think you will quickly soon and realize, and then, you know, every opportunity has an expiration date. It's okay to be at a place and feel like, okay, I learned, I got all I was, I was supposed to get, and now it's time for me to move on. Like, there's nothing wrong with moving on. Right. And, you know, I'm a firm believer, it's the side hustle mentality in that you should try to learn as much as possible from companies Absolutely. like you if you have any intention one day of building something on your own you have to look at everything as this is a learning opportunity this is a teaching opportunity so let me humble myself and get be the best i can and get the most out of it so how did you make sure that you stood out you formed those relationships and you just went out there and hustled how did i do that 
Um, well, I will say the beauty about being an assistant, and you're right, it's not for everybody, but the beauty I took from being an assistant was I recognized that I was in a very powerful position just because of who I was supporting. Uh, this man is an icon. This man is, you know, like a, a living legend, you know, like for our generation, especially like in the music and entertainment and Hollywood space. And I recognized very early on, like, okay, if I'm the nucleus with this, like I have to use this to my advantage. While I was working for Puff, I never thought that my next step was owning my own business. I thought that I was going to go work back at a record label or maybe I was going to work for like a management, a music management company, like a rock nation, like these types of companies. I never thought that I was going to have a business um, on my own. But while I was in that position, I knew whatever I'm doing next, that this has to be my calling card because I have to kill it. Yes. So <laughs> I wanted to be involved and everything. I was never the assistant handing my boss a sheet of paper and saying, your attorney said you need to sign this. I would be the assistant. I would be reading it. And <laughs> it so I said, but that, that only made me better. And it was, right. was that we had a very transparent office space, but like, just think of you, if your assistant gave you something and said, sign this, you would probably look up to her and say, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And then she was like, I don't know. They just told me to give it to you to sign. That's a different girl than a woman saying, hey, actually, this is from your attorney. This is actually about the X, Y, and Z terms. They need your signature here. The other party has signed. If you have any questions, you can speak to X, Y, and Z. It's a difference. I always took my job a little bit further. Um, so I was able to be the middle person from um, the fashion world, his, his music world, just like his talent relationships, business, restaurants, fragrance. Like I took my job so seriously because I always knew when this time is up and wherever I'm going to be led next in life, I need people to know that like I was here and I killed it and I have acid. You don't get that type of opportunity and have acid. Absolutely. How and when did the idea for the Vanity Group start brewing? And what were the first steps you took to get started? The steps for the Vanity Group started brewing... It started brewing maybe like my last year working at Bad Boy. It was brewing to the fact of I could maybe do a company where I got celebrities to attend events, almost like a celebrity wrangler. Mm -hmm. That was the first thought, but it wasn't a priority and it wasn't something that I actively was pursuing. I actually um, got my logo in 2008 and formatted my LLC in 2008. So it, I created it and I just sat on it because I, one, I was too busy to dedicate to it. And it's like, you can't have a full-time job working like where I was working and do think about doing anything on the side. So it was after I um, resigned from my job, I resigned from my job just because I had what reached an expiration date. Um, it was after I resigned from my job that I took some time just to decompress and figure out what I wanted to do next. And in that time, my phone started ringing. Hey, Carlene, can you do the XYZ event for us? Or we need an event for the Grammys done and we need it done next week. Or it's we want to do a party in Paris and it needs to happen in the next 14 days. So it was about... Um, I would say like two years of that, that a girlfriend of mine, actually my line sister, she said, you know, you're operating a business. I was like, you think so? She's like, <laughs> yes, like, this is a business. And it actually started as like, we should do something. She's like, you should do a launch event. So people know it's real. And I'm like, do you think people are going to show up? I'm like, what for real? Like it was, I, I didn't believe in myself. So it was after two, three years. I dreamed up this idea, like, I'm going to have a launch event because if you build it, people will come. So that was my frame of thinking. So I had this launch event to say that, like, the Vanity Group is a real thing. We are here. A friend of mine is a business owner. He let me use his business as my venue. I didn't have to pay for it. I definitely bartered my way through the decor and the drinks and everything. And that was October 10th, what, 2000. 13 and the next day the phone was just 
like it was like the doors of business were officially wow. open and it was true like I put it out there and people took notice and it just popped off from there so I'm trying to understand so you before you joined before you started the the Vandy group you'd been working for Mr. Combs and you resigned you know once you reached your expiration date without it being fully formed so what were you planning to do just for income while you were kind of taking that beat and figuring out next steps yeah, I resigned. And actually, during the time that I resigned, I was interviewing at different places, and none of the interviews were working out. The jobs either were whack, or they didn't call me back, or the employer wanted me to like shrink my personality in order to fit in there. And I was like, this is all actually pretty whack. I am not <laughs> for none of this. Um, that's why I think when one door closes, another, you know, 20 more will. We're open. You don't think about that in hindsight because you're so bruised that you didn't get the opportunity. Right. Think if I did get those whack jobs or think if I did stay there too long, I I would stay there and I would be there and the venue group would have never existed. So it actually was a blessing in disguise that none of those opportunities um, planned out. But yeah, I definitely needed to take a beat. And I think it's okay um, to take a beat decompress, get your mind together. I know everybody is on this thought of like, I need to have this by 30. I need to have this by age number 35 and all these things. It's like, you really need to experience life and get your mind right to open up your mind for whatever the next chapter is. Absolutely. And I also think that, you know, what I love about your story is during a time when you were kind of taking a beat, like people were calling you up and people were oh, yeah. kind of affirming you and re- reminding you like, no, we we need you. Like you are the expert at this. Who were those initial people? Were those clients, celebrities who you'd work with on, you know, while you were at Combs Enterprises? Absolutely. They were people who I met while working, um, definitely for Puff. It was people who knew that I handled Puff's life. And so they needed someone that they could trust. They needed someone who spoke their same language. You know, celebrity world is a whole different world. And a big part about it is who can you trust and who is tried and true. And it's like once you work for someone like that, it's like your your name and your reputation, um, pre- you know, precedes you. And it, it precedes you, especially if you have if you're about business. So people knew who I was and the word got out. So it definitely was the relationships that I had already established it wasn't a lot of people picking up the phone to call me who never heard of me and knew who I am and that is 100% how the vanity group operates today we rarely get jobs like cold call jobs where someone googles us and say can you plan x y and z it is 100% um, relationship based the business that we acquire and what were those early days like? So you have the big launch party. So far, you've told me you had a logo. I want to know, had you established an LLC at this point, a business bank account? Were you working out of your apartment? What what happened next? I'm all about relationships. So while I was a bad boy, I actually went to the gentleman who ran like new business development. I said, I'm thinking about starting a business. But I don't really know. He helped me write my articles of, um, what do you call it? Articles incorporation. of incorporation. Didn't know what the hell that was. He's like, you need this, you need that. I was like, what? Um, so, and he, um, shout out to Harry a few years ago. But Harry actually helped me, like, set up my articles of incorporation. He walked me to go um, set up a bank account. I didn't know that I needed, like, my own business bank account. So he came in and he helped me through that process. And that just kind of set law for like a few years but that he definitely held my hand through that and in the earlier days of the Vanny group I worked in my apartment in Harlem at my little desk that is between the trash can and kitchen um, <laughs> in my apartment and I worked quietly and I listened to gospel and jazz and 90s R&B and I worked by myself it was a very lonely um, time I was very broke I know people say that they lose money in the first years of business, but I wasn't making money to even really lose it. I really was living check to check as, you know, as your parents always say, you don't want to live check to check. But I was living project to project because the project is when I would get paid. And during that time, I would eat 
um, ramen noodles. I would go to like the hood grocery store and would get what like five for a dollar or whatever it was. I like sold some very fancy clothes. Like I was doing anything I could to like keep things uh, afloat. Wow, that's real. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that. And you were working by yourself, project to project. So what do you think were some of the hardest lessons you learned? And let me be more specific, because as I was working through planning my first live event this year, my first live podcast, there's so much I didn't know about what went into events from like insurance to just every detail to what, you know, chairs you need. And looking back, what do you wish you knew about putting on the type of events you produce, whether it was how to get money up front you know, from clients, so you weren't struggling, waiting for them to pay at the end to just anything. What what were some of those hardest lessons and how did you deal with them? The mistakes were such a blessing for me because if I didn't have the mistakes, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Some of my hardest lessons were giving my clients too much upfront. I really didn't, I had an agreement, but like I didn't have a process of where they, um, like, if someone called me, like, Carlene, could you do an event? I would be so excited to get the event done. I'd be like, yes, I would go to the venue. I would get everything <laughs> together, flowers, invitation. And these people wouldn't have signed an agreement. They wouldn't have paid a deposit. And then I would have did all that. And plenty of times they came back and said, um, actually, we're not going to do the event anymore. We just, we don't want to do it. Wow. And that's when I realized, okay. There is something called sweat equity and people have to pay you for it. So that's when we started adopting, okay, like there's a deposit process. There's an agreement process. Like, but I, I had to go through it and experience it and get burned to realize that like, this is what you need to do. And this is, this is connected to what I told you in the beginning, as far as I never said I wanted to be an event planner or an event producer. So Maybe if that was my original goal, I would have known, like, before you start playing the event, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and one, two, three, and blah, 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 blah. I was just running and gunning and just pure energy um, and talent to get all these things done. But I didn't, for many years, I didn't know what I was doing. So one thing, to answer your point, it was process and procedure. I didn't have that, and that needed to be um created a hundred percent uh up front because if you don't have process and procedure your company lacks foundation but i think you need to go through the seasons of not having foundation so you can figure out what process and systems work best for your business and so for other event producers or experienced curators are there some like one two three processes you can just say that you you shouldn't be starting anything unless you figure out how you're going to do these three things absolutely you should not be starting any process until they pay you a deposit get your coins because guess what as a small business you have operation costs that you need to pay and you can't pay those things if you're not getting any money coming in so first i would 100 percent Make sure that you have a agreement in place or some sort of deal memo. If you can't afford an attorney, that is a luxury for business to consult an attorney. It can be a very simple deal memo, but definitely have something in writing. My name is Carlene. I am responsible for these five things. This is the due date. This is how much you're going to pay me. And you sign a simple letter. Like It doesn't have to be as thought out. But definitely you want to have some sort of agreement in writing. Definitely a deposit, the deposit. And for your third, I definitely will say, hmm, as a new event planner or a new event producer, I would say do your research. Um, I was not doing a lot of research at the beginning because I was just running and gunning. I was trying to live and make sure that I have food on the table and I could actually pay my rent. I figure if I was doing research in the beginning, I probably would be a little bit further along than I am. Now, I wasn't concerned about comp competition because it didn't matter to me. So it wasn't even worth me like, who are the p other people in my market and what are, they, what are they doing? I never thought about that because I was too busy worried about how I was going to like get through this job and get the next one. 
Hey guys, it's Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsors. Story time. Let me tell you about the first time I had to send an invoice to a client. It was back in 2011. I was doing some social media freelance work for a major brand. And when it was time to get paid, they told me to just invoice them. I was racking my brain like, how do I send an invoice? How does this process work? Then I discovered FreshBooks. I signed up for an account, created my very first invoice, sent it over to the client, and they paid it immediately. The whole thing was seamless. And I also remember feeling super proud because I look professional and that's what I want. That's why I highly recommend FreshBooks for my fellow side hustlers. FreshBooks invoicing and accounting software is designed specifically for small business owners. It's simple, it's intuitive, and it keeps you way more organized than anything you try to do on your own. FreshBooks lets you create and send professional looking invoices in 30 seconds and then get them paid two times faster with automated online payments. Plus, you can file expenses even quicker and keep them perfectly organized for tax time. And the best part? FreshBooks grows alongside your business. So you'll always have the tools you need when you need them without ever having to learn accounting. Try it free for 30 days, no catch and no credit card required. Just go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle pro and enter side hustle pro in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash side hustle pro and tell them side hustle pro sent you. You know, two other things that really intrigue me about this, how you're making this work, you know, this line of work is number one, as someone who has hired event planners before, whether it be for my wedding, whether it be for Side Hustle Pro Live and shout out to them for making those things happen. Um, I'm a numbers person, right? So I I have ideas and I, and I see you as a visionary. How do you balance being the visionary, but also staying on budget? And, and did you, what is that your strength to do both? Or did you quickly have to hire someone else? It is, it is definitely my strength to do both. But now that I have a full-time staff that I pay every two weeks, now they can absorb the budget building. Um, my problem early on was that I didn't understand selling a client a dream and a dream that couldn't fit in their budget. Mm. Um, so that's a good question to always ask client like, Do you have an idea of the budget you want to spend or the neighborhood you want to spend? Because me being a dreamer and I'm such big picture all the time, I could be pitching to a client a Mercedes level (laughs) idea. They have a Kia budget. And it's like, right. I'm like, how much is this going to cost? That's what I'm always thinking about. (laughs) And I would have shot myself in the foot because I would have sold them this idea of how beautiful something looked when in fact they actually couldn't afford it so early on I had to realize how to scale my ideas and scale my grandness grandness to fit different levels and in different budgets Um, when you are an entrepreneur when you are a business owner you 100% will become a numbers person because you have to live, you have to breathe, you have to survive um, off of money. So me being a business for myself actually taught me to be cost conscious. Um, It has made me a wizard with um, budgeting. I can walk in a room in two seconds, tell you how much everything costs or how much they spent on it um, because I look at budgets and I look at numbers all the day. That is my least favorite part of producing an event and I'm now I have a team member who can absorb that I just want to be able to like dream and like (laughs) exactly as someone who's hired planners um I struggle because it's kind of like I almost I I don't know if this is realistic or not but I want to be hands-off I want you to just like do it all because I really hate event planning. <laughs> However, I find that as the decision maker, as the p- the person paying for everything, I'm constantly asked, you know, my opinion. And I, then I feel like I'm involved with the planning, which I didn't want to mm. be involved with. <laughs> so how that, do you juggle that process and make it smooth for clients? That doesn't happen at the Vaney Group because our clients are rock stars and they're too busy to go back and forth with us. That's why they hire us. Right. They just show up. They just want to show up. So we are completely soup to nuts. Like 99.9% of the events that you see that we have produced, 
It's we've created it, we've produced it, we have developed it, we've done the strategy. Like the client has maybe given us like a little bit, like, oh, I like, I want to do a birthday party. And from there, we are taking it and run with it. So there is no back and forth process with our client. There really isn't an approval process. We are in a very unique place because our clients love us and they trust us and they know our work and they know we're going to bring that heat. We, we somehow are thankful enough that we get to bypass that process. And the clients that we do work with um, that, that kind of want to be involved, it's a little bit of a tug and war for us because our, my thought is that if you're paying us to do a job, we want to be able to do it and take the load off of it. And it's like, why pay us if you have to be involved in every step of the way? <laughs> right. It's like micromanaging. So if you're going to so. micromanage. Right. Exactly. So we try our best to disarm the client and let them know, like, you're paying us so that we can make these decisions for you. And we actually are good at um, our job. So our goal is always for the client just to come up, dance, drink, and have a great experience. Yeah. And you let them know we got this. Exactly. <laughs> so what have you ever had an experience in your early days when a client was unhappy? And if so, how did you deal with that? Absolutely. Um, we've had um, not many, but a few occasions where the client um, wasn't happy. And this was another um, moment for us where we had to tighten up on our systems, policy and, and procedure. And it's like, OK, with this client, things kind of went left and we realized that, okay, this is how we learn from this and this is how we need to pivot. Um, I believe it was Obama's chief of staff that says a crisis without uh, a learning experience is a waste. So it's like if we would have mm. had this crisis with a client and we didn't learn or we didn't pivot from it, we would have been continuing to make these mistakes. And that is where... Um, your policy and procedures are fine tuning them come into place. Yes. And speaking of policies and procedures, I've seen you joke on like your IG stories and maybe it's half joke, half truth, but mm -hmm. you know, that Morgan, that Morgan DeBond founder of Blavity is like your CFO, your business advisor. Yes. How have you <laughs> leaned on other black women entrepreneurs to grow your business, especially in areas where you don't feel that it's your strength? Um, absolutely. Um, well, shout out to Morgan. I, from the moment I met her, um, we like casually had dinner and she like read my whole life into <laughs> girl, you should just, I wish you were my chief revenue officer. So I joke every time I see her, like, here come my um, CRO, like, here she come. <laughs> right. Because she has a different mindset and a different, um, different lens than I have. Her lens is about getting to the paper. My lens is about making shit beautiful. So we think you know, in two completely um, different ways. And I can say, I'm proud to say I have a community of other Black women, other women of color who are in my, I would say, like, sister circle of business. I don't have all the answers, and I never claim to be. So I'm always looking to identify talent that we can work with and not even, like, hire full-time or maybe, like, consult with us. It's like, I am not the best. Um, person with the accounts payable and receivable and the sending of the wires and all this, guess what? I have to mm -hmm. hire someone to do that. We have a business manager, a black woman. She does all that for us. Like if, I, if I'm second guessing something and um, I'm in need of an opinion on how to navigate something, like my leak is probably going to be the first person I call because she's been at it. You know, she got a few years head start on me and she's walk the walk before I have got to it so she can be able to like direct me and guide me. And as far as just um, the black community as a whole, like we always try to hire um, black women or the small black businesses. That's how our dollars are going to like thrive and continue to recycle um, amongst, amongst our, our community. Now, how do you, in short, earlier you mentioned that you weren't making money, you were living on ramen noodles, but you have grown, you're, you know, going into your sixth year in the business. How do you ensure that you'll be profitable, continue to be profitable? 
That's a good question because I just had a conversation with my um, accountant today having a fit with them. But I am in the season of preserving or cost containment. Um, as I mentioned, I'm very cost conscious. And as you know, when you are a business owner, sometimes you have great seasons. Sometimes you have seasons that are not so great. Oh, yes. Bills, the bills don't stop. I can't stop. I can't stop my payroll. So we are very, I think the word is scrappy as a business. Like we are super resourceful and we can handle things in house. Uh, we will because we don't have an endless open budget just to like do whatever. And because I was broke for so long, and finally got to a season like, okay, we're making the capital and the money is coming in consistently where I can now advance to this stage. Because I was broke for so long, I am super conscious of preserving wealth and making sure that like we're not just having money for now and that money will continue for years to come. And speaking of payroll, I love your team, Carlene. I really just, oh, I really do. And I love seeing you guys you. and, you know, how you, you're coordinating events. So thank you for sharing behind the scenes. If you guys aren't watching her IG stories, you need to. Um, but I know it wasn't easy building that that right team. No, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about um, what did you finally kind of land on some secret sauce to to hiring the right people, especially when you're working with the kind of clientele that you're working with and you want to maintain that reputation? Oh my God. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I landed with the secret sauce. I think with this go around, I was very lucky because I learned from my mistakes. So it has not even been, been a full, it's, oh yeah, it's, we've just made a year where we have an office. I have a full-time staff and we are in complete blast off mode and I would say with like my first team or my first experience with hiring staff, I was making a lot of mistakes. I was giving people too much rope to hang themselves. I was um maybe being too generous and too naive as a boss. And one of my business mentors told me early on, be slow to hire but quick to fire. There may be some people who were in the organization that were in a little too long and I was ignoring that little voice inside of me that said, this isn't right. This person is not a right fit and it's not a right spirit for the organization. They have to go. Um, and I ignored those when in hindsight, that was my, it's almost like dating a guy. Like when you do something, it's like, should I stay with them or should I break up? <laughs> it's, it's the same thing with hiring staff. And that's why, that's why the cold be slow to hire, quick to fire comes to mind because you don't meet a man and he becomes your boyfriend. There's a dating process. You're going to dinner, you're filling each other out and you have to do that same thing when you are hiring staff because it's like you're you're interviewing or dating people to become married to you and, and you know in a business uh, capacity. So I would say this time around I I got to a season where everybody was gone and I had to like take a pause for like a month and like we couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the personnel to do any jobs and I had to start fresh with hiring a staff. And I think with this new team, um, who is a, a dream, I, I learned from my mistakes. I was a bit, I took my time with the hiring, um, process. Uh, and I think when you are working in this type of unorthodox Saying, which means like we're in a very much like rock and roll industry. So it's you really need to have the heart and the spirit uh, to work and thrive in this type of business. And I think me taking my time with identifying people um, work. And another thing I did this wrong the last time I was not giving my staff, I think, grace all the time. You have to meet people where they where they are. Like everybody is at different levels in their career and I'm making this up. It's like you can't ask the coordinator to do director level things just because you have a small task. It's bad. You have to recognize right. that this person may not be there in their professional journey. Or you can't be asking the director to be doing your CEO level task. So but I had to experience that and hit my head a few times to learn my lesson and get it right the second time. And then do you work on training that person if you want them to get there? Do you do you also have to recognize that I need to spend more time training? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
I was blessed um, at Bad Boy um, to train for a year under our chief of staff. And I watched her. I watched how she moved. I watched how she wrote her emails. I watched how she approached Mr. Combs. Like I studied everything about her and she created that by design. So when it was my time to like step into the role of like being his assistant that I would thrive. And I take that same, um, I take that same mentality with my own, with my own staff. I do spend a lot of time with them. I am. They probably think I'm crazy, but whenever they start, I'm like, (laughs) there has to be some sort of quality control um, training session so that um, there there are no no leaks in your business. So I definitely take my time with them. I'm like, I need to review every email before it goes out. Like, just don't copy me. Like, I need to make sure that, like, your voice and your language is, you know, to the caliber of what I think it should be. And I also, I, I try my best to empower them. If I think, I always ask everybody when they start, what's their secret talent? Because if you have a secret talent, that could be something that we could use to our advantage over here. So I try to tap into people's talents. I had a young lady who didn't even tell me that she also was a graphic artist. I'm like, girl, what? I've been paying other people <laughs> and you can do this? So it is, you know, it really is, you know, like tapping into people's talents and where they, where there may be an area where there's a deficit working with them to get past that. Yes. I'm going to steal that. What's your secret talent? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the lightning round, I have to ask what is happening in Memphis, Carlene? (laughs) Oh my God. I'm so, I can't, oh my God. We have something cooking. I can't tell you yet. But oh my I, have been, I have been working so hard. It's like at the Vanny Group, we have been putting as much time into this as we would be our celebrity event. But it's something new and fresh for the city. I think we need it. And I'm blessed that I asked my um, partner in crime, my week, to be a part of it. And she said yes. So in a few more days, we're going to drop it, all the information about it. And I'm hoping that people just go nuts and lose their mind and want to show up and show out and support. Yes. All right. And when this episode airs, you guys, it will probably be live. I tried to get the sneak peek, but let's hope um, it is live. <laughs> um, and I, in Memphis. October 26th in Memphis. I like that you're going back to the hometown and you're yeah. not forgetting about Memphis. So now we're going to jump into the lightning round. Basically, you just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Let's do this. All right. Number one, what is the first resource that comes to mind when you think of what has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Hmm. Um, being under the tutelage of the right people. A lot of people jump out and they say, like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to start my own brand business. They've never worked with a brand. They've never worked with a company that has ever produced anything with brands. So I'm great that I had the the opportunity in my career to be trained under people to see and recognize excellence so that I had the gut to actually do it on my own. Yes, I like that one. Um, number two, what's been the best business book or live event that you have consumed this year? Oh, my goodness. I actually just got gifted this book. It's called... Um, clockwork for your business. And it has, it was everything that I was um, thinking in my head that I was experiencing as a business owner, but I could not articulate. It's called designing your business to run itself clockwork. Um, And it basically is Um, tools for the business owner who was once a one man or a one woman show the tools of how to like level up and get your business to run seamlessly. Ooh, okay. And number three, who is a black woman entrepreneur that motivates you to keep going and why? Hmm. Oh my God. That's a good question. Black women, black woman business owner who motivates me. Who could, I have so many. I have so many, but I'm going to just say my leak. I'm going to say my leak because I know your audience is probably very familiar with her, but my leak is a real one. Um, she has been such a great, um, I would say, I always call her like my fairy god 
business sister. She's been such a light for me. She's been very open. She's shared so many resources with me. Uh, she wants to see me win. And it's great to um, have a friend and a friend in business um, who you can use as a sounding board. It's very hard when you're a business owner. It's a very lonely place. And you can be talking to someone that don't even know what the hell you're talking about because they can experience <laughs> it. Um, and she is someone that is a visionary in so many ways. And I'm inspired by my friends who just continue to do dope things. When I see my leak, when I see my girlfriend, uh, Kalana, when I see my girlfriend who just got some big fancy job at the NIH, like me seeing my friends out there getting it, it just motivates me that like it's attainable and I can, I can do it too. You know, it's all about the company you keep. If you're around a bunch of girls that are like crabs in a barrel or they're not doing anything, it's like, that ain't the energy I want. Like I never want to be the only Beyonce. Like I want a crew of all Beyonce. Like why can't we all be do dope? You know, yes. I, I, iron, iron sharpens iron. And that's the type of community of women that I want to be around. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Personal habit that has helped me in my business, listening. Sometimes we, we, we are listening to talk. Like we're so happy. We're so quick to like want to respond to people that we aren't really taking in and listening to what they are saying. I had said to myself earlier this year, I want to be a better listener and take my time and be more strategic with when and how I respond to people. Um, and so, yeah, being a, being a great listener is something that I think is undervalued in, in business and hearing the people in your work community. Absolutely. Especially in your line of work. And finally, number five, what is your parting advice for Black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? No guts, no glory. Oh, <laughs> you have to jump like this. Our life is not a dress rehearsal. We don't get this moment. We don't get these moments back. Um, I think you have to not be afraid to jump. Honestly, that is what makes I think the definition of entrepreneur is a risk taker. You have to be comfortable taking risks and you have to be comfortable being very uncomfortable. So finally, where can people connect with you and the Vanity Group after this episode? Oh my God, you guys can connect with me on Instagram. I'm always struggling to post more. It's like such a job for me, but I think you post so much. I, I am actually like, I need to post more like Carly. <laughs> Like, we've been looking for a social media manager forever, but it ain't happening. <laughs> but you can follow me online at, I mean, Instagram at Carlene Roy, K-A-R-L-E-E-N. And we actually have a new website. You guys should go to it. It's been up maybe like five, 10 days now. So at thevanitygroup.com, you can see all that I do, our work, keep up with me. And yeah, that is our one-stop shop for all that we have going on as far as our visibility to where to find us. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair, Carlene. There you have it, guys. Head over to sidehouseofpro.co slash Carlene Roy for all of the show notes from this episode, including all the books and tips that Carlene mentioned. Thanks so much for joining and talk to you next week. Hey, hey, thanks for listening. Now stay connected in between episodes by texting Side Hustle Pro to 44222. You'll get my weekly Six Bullet Saturday newsletters where I share what I'm up to, what I'm reading, my business tip of the week, and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS. Thank you.